Hi, I'm Andy Binns uh, from Change Logic, um, and um, I want to share with you today a case study about how an organization can apply this notion of ambidexterity, doing two things at once. And in this case, we're going to be talking about the Atlanta Opera responding to the crisis that is created by the COVID pandemic and how live opera was no longer possible, but how they've reimagined what live opera means. And at the same time, they've developed a new form of digital opera. And so I'm here today with uh, my colleague at the Harvard Business School, from the Harvard Business School, uh, Professor Michael Tushman. Hello, 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 everybody. But also, I'm joined, we're joined by Thomas Vullin, the uh, General Director and Artistic Director at the Atlanta Opera. Thomas, tell us about that. What are you doing down there? So, um, when the pandemic happened, uh, there was a lot of information out there about uh, what's going on with the coronavirus. Uh, and then the question was, do we continue the season or not? Do we cancel the rest of the season? And the decision was to cancel it indeed. And then the most important question was, do we hold on to the hope of reopening at some point in the 2021 season? Or do we make a decision to postpone the whole season and come up with a new, absolutely brand new idea for a model of a company? Uh, we assembled this incredible group of epidemiologists and public health experts, and we devised a plan to get back to performing safely. And the conclusion was that we are going to do that outdoors with a roof over our head in the shape of a circus tent. Uh, and the sides of that tent are open to allow for fresh air to come in and out. Uh, reduced orchestra, uh, reduced uh, chorus, no, no big choruses, uh, and productions that put forward theatricality uh, and spectacle while creating maximum safety for audience and for performers. That's basically the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, most opera companies are uh, focusing on digital content, but there is starvation and saturation. At the same time, people want to see something live. They want to be engaged. And so it's extremely popular for us. And there's great excitement in the community for it. And you and the board decided to recreate the Atlanta Opera. Can you talk about how you did that? How you engaged your audience, your community, your organization, your board uh, to recreate the organization in this moment of absolute crisis? And when it comes down to it, there's really uh, three components in this new business model in, in moving forward with this. The first one and foremost is safety. People will not show up. You will not have their support if you don't prove that you have made every effort to at least prevent an outbreak. It's impossible to prevent an infection but it is possible to prevent an outbreak. So that's why we engaged those epidemiologists headed by Carlos De, Professor Carlos De Rio from Emory University and all those health specialists. And we created this very detailed 37 page uh, protocols for safety, for reopening in a safe way. We also engaged a risk mitigation coordinator, a special disease uh, person that is in every rehearsal that we have. We are rehearsing with masks. I'll send you some footage, it's hilarious. Everything is uh, divided. They have to sing with masks on. We have to take breaks to sanitize our hands. You can't share props. I mean, it's, it's god awful, but it's also exciting because we are back to rehearsals. So that's the first element is the safety. And the second uh, element is the location. So as I mentioned, indoors is not safe. Outdoors is safe. And so what does outdoors look like? What is the most exciting configuration of being outdoors? You can't just be outdoors without a roof over your head. You can't have lighting. You can't, um, you can't have scenery if you're just outdoors. And so the idea was let's get back into this, into this principle of, the, of theater in a circus. Mm -hmm. And there's also something inspirational about circus, like philosophical about circus, because across the centuries, uh, societies had to deal with crisis from pandemic to the Great Depression to wars, you name it. And there is something about the grit and the perseverance of the circus. You know, they, they meet, they pitch a tent by the railway station and circus is coming to town. It doesn't matter if it's 1929 
1941 or any dark time in history. And this is a dark time in history. So there's something about that ethos that is very important for us. And then the third part, you know, so we talk about safety location. The third part is people. The people of Atlanta need something. They need to be uplifted right now. They need to get out of the bunkers, out of those terrible Zoom meetings where they're not really connected and be able to watch something live that will inspire them. Just what is, at the end of the day, what is the Atlanta Opera and like, why do you exist? Why not just fold the tent, if you will? Because the community really needs live performance right now, as long as it's safe. And there is something about the choices of the shows that we are, we are putting on stage that has a very strong comment on our time. You know, we didn't talk about the pieces we're doing, which are Pagliacci, a show about uh, a circus coming to town where life imitates art and art imitates life. The other show is the Kaiser from Atlantis, the Emperor of Atlantis that was written in the Holocaust mm. in 1941 as a parody about Adolf Hitler. It's a parody about a, an emperor that makes a pact with death because he realizes that he can be only powerful if many people in the world dies. That's where he gets his power. Well, death gets pissed off with him and breaks his sword. Nobody dies in this world until the Kaiser, that emperor, sacrifices himself, dies, and then a world order is restored. When the Nazis discovered that, they broke into the, the camp, Theresienstadt, and sent everybody to Auschwitz to their death. The show was never premiered. And so doing something like that right now, against the backdrop of everything that is happening in the world right now, I think is a very powerful experience. What is your and the board's aspiration for the Atlanta Opera as it moved into this dark period? And has it shifted as one, and has it shifted from the pre-dark period? Our inspiration and ambition has always been the same, to be the leading opera company in the United States or one of the leading opera companies in the United States. And uh, the cost structure of many opera companies, of the leading opera companies right now, is very problematic for them to continue operations. Uh, and, and that's very different with smaller companies like the Atlanta Opera. And so if we're able to create a sustainable business model that is full of innovation and exciting productions, we will bring uh, support from all over the country and interest from all over the country, not just Atlanta. Died because he died? I, don't, I, don't quite I just want to thank both of you. Like, you know, for Mike, you've been my inspiration from day one. And, you know, kind of like the, the figure that inspired us through all this. Uh, I constantly think about you and everything I learned from you and Harvard. And Andy, you know, ever since we met, I think it was three years ago, uh, in Boston, and then coming onto the advisory board and getting Change Logic to help us through this has been amazing. So I just want to thank you for this. You're very welcome. It's yeah, you're great, very great welcome much. indeed, Tom. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome what you're doing, and I'm so thrilled. Michael and I were were due to meet you last on March 13th for a performance of of Porgy and Bess. Uh, and, and, and that was the moment, March 13th, at which you were closed down and, and uh, you know, had to deal with this, with this new, this new reality. That happened to be Friday the 13th. <laughs> and so, you know, I never believed in uh, Friday the 13th, but now I'm very, very mm -hmm. fanatic about never programming anything on Friday the 13th. We had to cancel the performance. Uh, the authorities, the city, the government uh, did not indicate yet at that point that we should do that. But our sense was that there was too much risk involved in having a live performance. And so we canceled uh, the remaining performances of Porgy and Best that were sold out, by the way, Friday and Sunday performance. When we spoke after that uh, calamitous Friday the 13th, your question to me was, how do we rethink our business model? How do we reimagine opera for this, for this new world? And how do we re-energize our team uh, to help get us there? So what was the organizational innovation uh, that you used to, to, to do that? You know, I have a powerhouse uh, senior management team and uh, it's, it, they completely stood behind this idea of doing the right thing, focusing on 
the people first doing the right thing. And uh, it's a fascinating combination of people that really demonstrate everything that you all teach about. Because you know you teach about that uh, dynamic between uh, core and explore, or, or as Mike likes to say, exploit and explore. So the live opera, this reimagining of live opera is one fabulous thing you've done. The other dimension of this is how you might go digital. And as you said, there's a lot of, it's a digital opera saturation, but you're gonna take a different approach. Right, I mean, so, so the uh, digital approach right now uh, across the industry is let's make movies or let's create content. Uh, I, I detest that idea of let's create content because there's a lot of content out there. It's gotta be meaningful for you to wanna see it. Like you can choose anything on Netflix and Hulu and HBO. So why would you wanna watch this specific content? And the answer is that we're inventing and again, the proof is in the pudding, so talk to us in a few months. But what we're talking about is creating a new style of opera film. Uh, currently, there are two styles of, of opera and film. There's the Met HD broadcast, uh, which I find very frustrating, you know, despite the fact that I worked there for seven years and was involved with it. It only reminds me of the fact that I'm not in the theater and I'm watching something archival that just frustrates me that I'm not there to experience it. Uh, the other style is an absolute movie. Uh, and not a lot of them these days, but you know, a lot of, a lot of them appeared in the 80s right. uh, where it's not a live performance, but it's kind of a, uh, a movie. And what we're talking about is uh, creating something that has the core product, which is a live performance. And then around it, shooting from different angles, uh, all the performances, plus additional takes after the show is done, plus additional takes before the show is mounted to create content that then is completely new. So even if you saw the show live, if you see the actual movie, it's a different version of it. So there's a fabulous um, uh, uh, application of what you learned at Harvard from Michael, the ambidextrous organization. You are learning to do two things at once, live opera and new, a new opera, but building off of the assets that you've created from the live. And, and you've got a different team running each of these things. And you're going to reimagine opera not once, but twice as you do this. It's, uh, it's very ambitious, I will say that. And yes, it, I, I, chalk it, I chalk a lot of it to... Uh, the theories that I studied from Professor Tushman. I just want to say, Tomer, how like, what a story. What, what a story. And, and it's, still, it's still unfolding. So cross your fingers because so many things can go wrong from the elections to uh, an outbreak to who knows what. But you know what? Even if this explodes in our face, we know that we try to do the right thing. Yeah. In, in line with that aspiration. That's where you were in that speech in, in the park. I mean, you're, you're, this is like a magnificent opera. Opera is not going to go away and you're going to be there to help recreate it. Yeah. See you on the other side. I, I appreciate it. I want to finish, if you, if you don't mind, with one quote that I think is absolutely right for us, but also for organizations all over the world. It was Kurt Weill, who wrote Three Penny Opera, uh, who said in 1928, if the boundaries of opera cannot accommodate the theater of the time, the Zeit Theater. These boundaries must be broken. <laughs>